So again, thank everybody for joining. As I always start off with these conversations, this will be on all your favorite platforms, Spotify, Amazon, uh, all those different places for podcasts under that lead lag live banner, as well as available on YouTube. Uh, And like I said, you're always encouraged to come up and engage. With that said, my name is Michael Gayad, publisher of the Lead Lag Report. Joining me today is Willem Middlecoop, who is the founder and CEO of the Dutch-based Commodity Discovery Fund, prolific author. His most recent one is The Big Reset, which we'll talk about. Willem, for those who are not familiar with your background, introduce yourself. Who are you? How did you get interested in markets? And what are you doing currently? Yeah, thanks for the invitation. I just turned 60, and I've been active in investing in financial markets since the 1990s. I started out as a journalist, actually a photojournalist, worked for Reuters, and did a lot of journalism, worked for financial television in the Netherlands, was a market commentator on Dutch TV in the early 2000s, and took some profit on my real estate investments in the early 2000s, and was very interested in the financial system, and was very surprised that I uh, was able to finance my real estate in the 1990s so easily. So I decided to look into the origin of money and to the history of money. So I call myself a student of monetary history. And my books, uh, most of my books, I've, I've written eight books in total, published eight books in total. Most of my books are about the financial system, but also on the energy system. I'm also the author of the Tesla Revolution. My books have been printed in eight languages, including Chinese and Arabic. And well, that, that, that's that's it. How involved has the process been in writing those books for you? I mean, you're prolific, obviously, in the way that you think and and put pen to paper. Is it one of those things where you just have this this internal urge to get it out to put it in a, a formalized book? Talk, talk about that process. Process. Yeah. I always think it's <laughs> to me. It's always fascinating just the the process of writing a book. Yeah, it, it's the urge of telling a broader audience, informing them about how I see the world. I always, since I started to study financial system, this was in the middle and late 90s, I I was actually quite shocked (laughs) to learn how the financial system is is organized and structured. Nowadays, with crypto, everybody talks about fiat money and everybody talks about the house of cards. But I can assure you, in the late 1990s, People didn't understand. People didn't study money. You know, if <laughs> they weren't aware of the house of cards. And this all changed first when the internet bubble burst in the early two thousands. Then, of course, after Lehman crashed. And now we're all aware of the debasement of currencies. We're all aware that you need to hedge. We're all aware that you need to invest in all the government can't print. And, and, well, I I was always very busy writing about this stuff. First, I wrote some, well, some some articles just for friends who invested with me. And then I started to write for a Dutch newspaper. And and, and I started to to write blogs on on websites in the early 2000s. And then I started to work for Dutch television. And I received a, a broader audience. And besides my work for national TV, I always had this mailing list so i could communicate directly with a few thousands of the followers and then twitter arrived so um, then the audience grew a bit more and and after i i've been writing some of this stuff in the early 2000s it was around 2004 2005 that i started to get really worried about the state of the financial system and i really felt the urge to put it all in one one book and to warn people about a coming crisis and i published my first book in august 2007 and that was just before the credit crisis hit and well, from from that time on i always felt the urge to uh, to do some more research and i was but the questions after I published my first book, how can we solve this crisis? And my reaction was always, I don't know. You know, I'm glad I could analyze it, that, that we're in a crisis. But uh, I started to get more and more involved with central bankers. I'm uh, part of the advisory board of the OMVIF. OMVIF is like a monetary think tank in London. It's, it's a place where central bankers and the private sector meet. So I started to learn more and more about how, the, how central bankers are planning and, and, and organizing the system. And that's how I could write The Big Reset. And the undertitle of The Big Reset is The War on Gold and the Financial Endgame. So I started to understand that you can change the system almost in any way you want. <laughs> and central bankers have been planning to change the system. 
And that's where the idea of the big reset came from. And that book was published in 2014. I revised it in 2016. And actually, on the back cover of the book, uh, I wrote that around 2020, we need to see large changes coming to the financial system because uh, we're reaching the end of this uh, dollar-based system. Let's talk about the history of resets, because oftentimes people say the origins of money, but really what we care about is that break, right, where the system fully changes. So what is the history of resets, and what exactly does a big reset mean? Yeah, there's quite a bit of history if you look uh, at monetary resets. I always uh, tell people that the world's financial system is man-made. It's not something given by nature or (laughs) given by God. It's man-made. So you should consider it like a plumbing system, and you can change the plumbing system. And if you look in the past, the best example of a monetary reset is what happened in 1944 when the U.S., knew they would win the Second World War, so they invited 44 countries to come to Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, to discuss the world's financial system. And actually, the U.S. proposed a a new plan to to start using the dollar uh, instead of gold as the anchor for the world's financial system. The British, who used to have the British Empire in the 19th century, weren't too happy about uh, giving the U.S. all that power. So uh, John Maynard Keynes um, came with another idea. So he came from London with an idea to start using a world reserve currency, a a total new world reserve currency. He named it the Bancor. And, and, well, we all know the U.S. won. (laughs) And the U.S. had had been planning this monetary reset since 1942. And actually, they, they, they almost bribed the rest of the world. You know, the rest of, of the world was quite, well, we just we, we just came out of the Second World War and Europe was in ruins. And so the U.S. had to promise that the, the U.S. dollar would be as good as gold. So surplus dollars would all, always be, could always be exchanged for physical gold. That's what the U.S. Uh, promised and and you know the marshall plan was was part of this system so the u.s started to finance especially europe and i used this to build its well its empire actually yeah it's interesting i feel like that term reset to your point everyone started talking about that idea or became more popular after the great financial crisis as if that was the the real catalyst i've put out this tweet before and it's my belief that the real source of of where we are today, you can argue, goes back to 9-11, and in particular, the Iraq War. And I say that because it, I don't think it's a coincidence that the Fed's balance sheet is around $8 trillion, which is the estimate for how much the Iraq War cost uh, all in uh, to where we are. How does war factor into monetary breaks like this, resets? Well, if you study history... You can see that on average, every 92 years, we get a new world reserve currency. So before the U.S. dollar arrived in 1944 as the world reserve currency, we had the British Empire and the pound sterling. So in the 19th century, the U.K. was in control. And we've had the time that the Netherlands were the main currency, provider of the main currency, we had Spain and Portugal. So every 90 years, you see this change. And these changes often happen because you get a new well leader in the in, in the financial economic space so the us was the new leader after the british and now you can see uh, china rising and if you look at uh, e-commerce 75% of all e-commerce worldwide is is is, is china based now so china is becoming the main economy and, and you see all this pressure coming from Asia to no longer accept this uni, unipolar world centered around the US dollar. And, and often when there's the birth of a new superpower, uh, you will see a lot of tension arising because the old superpower, in this case, the United States is of course not happy with uh, China rising. So many of the wars are always related with these changes and with the fact that the superpower wants to stay in power so he's he, he's starting military actions to uh, increase its power base but you have this notion about imperial overstretch you might be familiar with that 
So many empires fail because they have this imperial overstretch where the burden of financing all these wars and all these military bases abroad and eventually kills them. And the U.S. seems they don't they they haven't learned from history because they have this imperial overstretch now the total sovereign debt of the us was 10 trillion in 2000s it's over 30 trillion now so we can't go on like this forever so that's why changes are needed i know china is obviously the, the the country everyone focuses on for future conflict but you know as we're seeing there's more and more discontent and frustration with the citizens and zero COVID policy. I'm curious if there's a part of you that maybe thinks that the concerns around an inevitable conflict with China are maybe overblown, that maybe China ends up, from a government perspective, looking very different because just like we saw with Egypt and the Arab Spring, you never know how things play out in terms of citizens maybe uprising. Yeah, that, that, that's true. And of course, in the US, everybody hopes that China will, re, uh, will enter a huge crisis in which the current uh, Chinese leadership might collapse. But we shouldn't forget, it's not about China. It's not only about China. China is part of the BRICS alliance. That's Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. The BRICS alliance have been around for some time. And the BRICS aligning, uh, alliance is gaining strength. And actually, there are dozens and dozens of, of countries uh, willing to, to join. And we've heard uh, Argentina is joining. Um, we even heard Saudi Arabia is is willing to join next year, and that would be a, a large, a, a, an incredible change. But if you look at this at, at this struggle from a broader level, you can see after after the uh, Russian invasion in Ukraine, we have all we've seen all the start of all these sanctions from uh, the Western countries, Western world. But there are over 140 countries worldwide who don't support sanctions. These 140 countries are not friends of Putin, but they decided to stay neutral. And most of these countries are just fed up with, with the U.S. being world's policemen, and they ask they ask themselves why weren't sanctions applied when the U.S. bombed and invaded Afghanistan or Iraq. So if you look at the number of people living in these 140 countries who don't support sanctions, we talk about over 6 billion people. And the countries supporting sanctions, that's less than 1.5 billion people. So it's really a a struggle, a fight now between the West, um, which all support this uh, U.S. well dollar-centered financial system, and and then there's the rest of the world who, who want to see a, a multipolar world in which uh, th- there's more cooperation between the West and the rest of the world. I know it's impossible to know, but I'm I'm curious if just from a thought experiment perspective, if you would have had the same 140 countries disagreeing on sanctions even 15, 20 years ago, is it is it a function of uh, how much of that disagreement is just purely around, you know, the realities around the energy crisis versus, you know, just broader frustration around the West's policies and, and broader global leadership? In, in my presentation, I always show two slides back to back. And one slide uh, shows a map of the world, and it shows which countries have the U.S. as the main trading partner and which countries have China as the main trading partner. And in nineteen uh, in two thousand, just twenty two years ago, seventy five eighty percent of the world had the U.S. as the main trading partners. Now, twenty years later, I think seventy uh, percent of all countries worldwide have China as the main trading partner. So, a majority of these sovereign nations see China as a more prominent partner than the U.S. So that fact, uh, of course, helped many of these countries to pivot from the west to the east and we also shouldn't forget that in the past especially in the 1970s 80s 90s the imf and the world bank were very powerful institutions highly connected with the us the birth of the both the imf and the world bank was also just after 1944 just after bretton woods so these are bretton woods institutions and these institutions financed many of the poorer countries. But many of these poorer countries in Latin America, Middle America, Africa, became fed up by the way the IMF and the World Bank were well pressuring these poor countries 
to do business with uh, U.S. corporations. And so they started to pivot away from the IMF and the World Bank. And now many of these countries, they take loans from China. They prefer to do business with China. And that's why China is building all these highways, railways in Africa, even building mines there to mine for commodities. So we've seen China taking over many, many parts of the world from an econ- economic point of view. Is, it, is there any way that can be reduced or, or reversed? Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's essentially a, a competition, right, between the U.S. and China when it comes to getting the attention of every other uh, country and doing business. What, play it out. What would need to happen in the U.S. Well, to, to be more competitive? Well, I always love to think in trends and life cycles. So everything has a life cycle, you know. Uh, uh, even an insect has a life cycle, maybe very short, maybe just one day. Uh, we as humans have a life cycle of around 80 years. Uh, the world reserve currencies have a life cycle of 90 years. And if you look at empires, they, they have a certain life cycle. And uh, Once you have reached the top in your life cycle, also as, a, as, a, as a, an American empire, as a British Empire, and once you've passed the top, well, actually, uh, everything goes downhill, and you can't reverse these trends. This is almost like a force of nature. And uh, a wonderful book, which explains a lot about these uh, trend changes and these different phases, is The Fourth Turning by Neil Howe. And he des- describes very well why many of these, well, many of these trends take 80 years. And I, I think there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> and you can see the US is getting weaker almost by the year. <laughs> Look at the leadership. Most leaders in Washington are 80, 80 plus now, around 80. And that's that's the sign. <laughs> you see all this corruption. You see the the, the, the very strong political, well, internal fights starting. So it's it's so clear that this empire is going down or losing power. Let's say it, let's put it that way. And I'm going to assume that you'd argue that a large part of that the catalyst was the removal of the gold standard. I mean, I've, just like everybody else on Twitter, right? You look at all these charts, you know, post 1971, <laughs> right? And they all go vertical. What what the fuck happened in 1970? Yeah, right. <laughs> great website, exactly. and it, it it tells it all, but. So it's all about the debasement of currency. But study history. If you study the fall of the Roman Empire, not many books will tell the story about the debasement of currency. But in my books, I always show a a chart of the debasement of the the Roman currency. The Roman coins, which they paid to their soldiers, you know, were 100% silver in the old days. And then they start to debase them in debasement until there was hardly any silver in the coins. And this coincided with the fall of the Roman Empire. And it has been the same for, for you know for millennia. Once you start to debase your currency, you started to walk onto the road which leads to the end. I've always wondered how that connects with population growth, right? Because presumably you debase your currency, especially when you're trying to maintain power because there's more there's more citizens in a country, right? And the more population growth there is, the more mouths that have to be fed and the more people need to be calm and, and not uprise, right, against the existing power structure. Is there an, Am I off on that idea that part of the debasement is related to just population growth and the need to try to just feed more people? Well, I think it's a factor. But again, if you study history, it's always about imperial overstretch. So... It's about uh, having an empire, which is just too large to support it. And first, you can make money in this empire. So you uh, you start to uh, steal or <laughs> colonize or whatever. But, but uh, after some time, the cost of keeping the empire, maintaining the empire, is, is larger than, than the profits uh, the empire delivers. And of course, we all know the U.S. saved the dollar in 1974 by having the petrodollar deal arranged with the Saudi king. And it was Henry Kissinger who proposed this special deal that the U.S. would always support the Saudi royal family in uh, all kinds of way. And then the Saudis would make sure that oil from Saudi and from oil-producing countries within the OPEC would be sold in dollars only. And by doing this, they could keep a strong dollar 
although it was no longer backed by any gold since they took the, gold, the dollar off the gold standard in 1971. But it has been going downhill for quite some time now. And the imbalances are so large now. And look at the, the, um, look at the deficits, look at the national debt. There's no way the U.S. can repay its debt uh, in currency with the same purchasing power. And every, everybody's starting to understand this now. So the worldwide inflation is not the result of the war in Ukraine. The worldwide inflation is the result of the debasement of the U.S. dollar. And the U.S. dollar is used to buy and to trade all commodities. So all commodities go up in price. And I can't, well, there's only one way you can reverse this or buy some more time. And that's to bring gold back into the system. And that's what the U.S. might be planning to do. So I think that's the only way they can buy some more time. How does the advent of cryptocurrency, Bitcoin in particular, fit into that? So we'll talk about sort of the, the idea of maybe going back to a quasi-gold standard, which I think would be a lot harder than maybe most realized. But how do you view the role of, of Bitcoin in that? Oh, it fits perfectly, perfectly well because the whole start of crypto and actually the whole birth of Bitcoin, it all started just after the fall of Lehman. So the invention of Bitcoin was a direct result of of the, uh, this well incredible financial crisis, which actually collapsed Wall Street. Most people seem to have forgotten this, but in September two thousand eight and October two thousand eight, most of Wall Street was collapsing, and the birth of Bitcoin as an alternative currency, a decentralized alternative uh, alternative currency, and its success started this whole crypto trends and one of the large fights uh, looming is the fight from fiat money against uh, against bitcoin because the more fiat money will be created and the central bank digital currencies are just another layer of fiat on top of the present house of cards and the more money central banks will create and the more central bank digital currencies they will introduce the more people will start to flee to bitcoin because bitcoin is maxed out at 20 21 million bitcoin you can't mine more than 21 million bitcoin and people will soon start fighting about it of course we're in a strong correction now and people who are smart will will, will take this opportunity to add to their bitcoin holdings and then we'll see a huge rise of bitcoin in fiat money terms, that's my humble opinion. I'm curious, Willem, uh, in all your research, how does the wealth gap come into play when it comes to resets on monetary systems? Right. So I've, I've long had this belief, I've made this argument in the media before, that you know, the reality is the notion of having a middle class isn't really based in history. Right. That we had that, obviously, yeah. for a large amount of time, but you know, the, the history of the human race would suggest it's much more what we're seeing more of, right? Well, concentration of wealth around a small percentage, whether it's a fiat-based system or a gold-based system, that's kind of just the nature of of societies. How do how does widening wealth gaps factor into these these kind of dynamics? Well, if you study all these former empires, I think the middle class in in the Roman Empire, you know, they were pretty well off, and they, you know they all had a pretty nice living, and you had the slaves who were doing the work. <laughs> And, but it, if you reach the end of an empire and you get these monetary resets or uh, system resets or changes of the empire, there's a huge transfer of wealth. That's You should see this as a transfer of wealth. And all people who own the paper assets, so the people who own the treasuries and who own the saving accounts, they will soon learn that it's almost worthless. You can, you, that, there's a great example of what we've seen in the crypto space. You know, the guys who thought they had assets in Luna and they were, these, were, these were valuable assets woke up and, and they learned it was zero. And the same goes with our institutional investors who have a lot of treasuries on their, uh, on their, on their books. So there's this huge transfer of wealth so people who, who didn't t- took the paper assets but started to trade their paper assets into hard assets and bought um, gold and silver or Bitcoin suddenly w- will learn they made quite a bit uh, of money and their neighbors who, still, uh, who still had their saving accounts. Uh, stud- study the hyperinflation Germany in the 1920s or Venezuela or Zimbabwe, all these 
all these. And Argentina is a great example as well. Argentina was the seventh richest country in the world in the 1970s. And there are so many examples in history that fiat systems broke down and actually the value of fiat went went to zero, close to zero. Yeah, reset the room for the remaining minutes since Willem's got to head out earlier than our usual hour here. Everybody here, please make sure you follow Willem Middlecoop here on Twitter. And again, if you want to come up and ask questions, click that bottom left mic request button. This will be available as a podcast under that lead lag live banner. Willem, I want to take it to, to what you do day to day for a moment with your fund. You've got your commodity fund and you focus effectively on companies that are finding, have some big discoveries when it comes to the commodity space. Outline your thesis on commodities more broadly. Why did you go into that side of the investment field back in early 2000? And how do you view the commodity space broadly here? Yeah, I've been of the opinion that uh, fiat money uh, should go down value uh, over time. So this debasement of currency trend, which started, let's say, in 1971, is ongoing and is 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 reach, reaching a new phase now. So the debasement, which shows itself in in inflation, is ten to twenty percent a year now. And I I decided for myself. I started to take profit on real estate already in two thousand three two thousand four, and I started to buy gold and silver as a hedge. And I was way too early. <laughs> I should have waited another ten years. But after I learned more and understood more and more about this system, I only wanted to hedge more. And I, I was a journalist at that time. And I stopped working as a journalist in 2008, just after the Lehman crash, because I was quite convinced, based on my study of monetary history, that investors would be looking for hard assets in, in, in the not-too-distant future. So actually, I started two companies in 2008. Both were precious metals related. One was a billion web shop. It's, it's still around, Amsterdam Gold. In th- after three years, we had uh, 100 million euro yearly turnover, yearly sales. So I sold that one. And I built the Commodity Discovery Fund to be able to invest in small companies making large mineral discoveries. So gold, silver, copper, nickel, zinc. And I've been working and building this fund, the Commodity Discovery Fund. And we have around 150 million under management now. This is all money from high net worth investors. We just want to diversify out of fiat into hard assets. And we try to take position in small companies working on significant metal discoveries worldwide. So actually, we we have a database and follow over 1,000 exploration companies worldwide. But we only invest in the top 100. And we first started as precious metals investors, but now we are almost metal agnostic because it doesn't matter if you discover uranium or nickel or copper or gold. If you make a large discovery as a small exploration company, you create value. And our exit strategy is to wait for the buyout because large companies like BHP and Rio Tinto will always buy out a small company making a large discovery. And we've had 75 buyouts since 2008. So that's, that's our model. Let's go to, uh, for a question. Uh, I, I don't agree with you because we're in a downtrend for quite some time now with Bitcoin. So this means the masses, the herd is selling, not buying. And, and we've seen this time and again in Bitcoin. Bitcoin has these great cycles. You always go down 70, 90 percent, and then you rise a few hundred or even a few thousand percent. And so many people got scared now because in the crypto space, there's so much cheating going on. There's so many liars. It, it, the crypto crowd is worse than the Wall Street crowd. But Bitcoin is different. You know, Bitcoin is, is really decentralized. So the fall of Luna and FTX, which is great, that's happening. All the cheaters are are being removed from the space. And people will soon learn that Bitcoin, it, it, it's about the fight of fiat against Bitcoin. And there will be so much more debasement of currencies because the central banker, central planners can do nothing but print money and print money. There's only one big risk is that all the, central bankers, central planners will start a huge war on Bitcoin and close the on and off ramps. And that's the only real risk I see for Bitcoin. Well, I will say also, I think the reality is, and last year was the real tell on this, right? Which is why I started putting laser and gold eyes. Uh, the moment you had everybody, every single actor, every single celebrity, you could imagine putting laser eyes, you could tell that that was going to be a near-term top, sure. which, sure. right, which meant a lot of people also got in 
and you know, there's a well-known behavioral finance dynamic called the snake bite sure. effect, right? Once yeah. bitten, twice shy, right? So, so I do think that there's probably just because of the sheer number of people who probably got in towards the top, there's probably a lot of people that would never touch cryptocurrencies broadly ever again, which you can argue is actually probably bullish. Yeah. But there's always, uh, don't forget, we're 8 billion people uh, in this world. I've got a lot of followers on Twitter, but it's only 125K. <laughs> you know, most people don't read my stuff. Most people, in this in this spaces, we have 350 people here, you know? that That's nothing. So we... We love we all 350 our... of you on the space, yeah, sure. just to be yeah, clear. Sure. <laughs> okay. But... but you know, the majority of the people, they're watching soccer now. It's Brazil, Switzerland, or they're watching their daily soaps or they're having dinner, you know. They don't spend their evening listening to this kind of stuff or researching this. But they will wake up once inflation hits them and they start to learn from their friends and their uncles and then they'll start to look into Bitcoin. We see this in our fund. We used to be quite small, let's say 30, 40 million as a management. Since the inflation started, since COVID, we see a huge inflow. And, and we don't advertise, but people are wait, waking up. They're starting to they want to diversify. They're looking for hard assets. We even saw the first pension fund in the Netherlands selling treasuries and buying physical gold, which is almost impossible for an institutional investor to do. So they will learn it the hard way. And, and some of them will buy gold. Some of them will buy silver. Some of them will, will buy Bitcoin. But smart investors, we have these discussions with high net worth every day in our office. And they understand you should own uh, real estate, you should own physical uh, metals, you should own, you should diversify, but you should own it all. But mo of course, most people are not rich enough to diversify that way. But there are so many people who have tens of millions or even hundreds of millions or even billions, and they want to get out of the system or at least diversify. I'm curious, I want to go back to the commodity discussion for a bit because you're, you're obviously very active in the space. Where are some of the more interesting trends uh, occurring in the commodity space beyond the the obvious discussions around gold and oil i mean uranium gets talked about quite a bit but yeah. what else is, is intriguing you know from your perspective the battery metals the battery metals we're we're in this very special moment in history where we have debasement of currency we have growing shortages in many metals the world's mine production can't keep up with demand and you should be aware that opening a new takes 10 to 15 years. We don't make enough new discoveries. So there will be shortages, especially after 2025. If the world doesn't reach a worldwide depression, you'll see shortages everywhere. We've done a lot of supply and demand studies. And the next 10 to 20 years will be incredible for commodity investors. I was stupid enough to start a commodity fund in 2008. That was the top of the last cycle. We've been rowing against the stream for the last 10 to 15 years because there was this down, downtrend in commodities. Everybody, everybody wanted to be in startups and tech. And now the market has, has turned, just like in the market turned in 2000 after the tech bubble burst. And if you look at it from a technical point of view, if you study it from Elliott Wage point of view, we just turned the corner, um, the commodity related investments were at a price at a 100 year low in the late 2020. So we just turned the corner and there's so much there's so much revaluation to be expected for the whole commodity space. And we concentrate on the battery metals because you have this huge demand, you have the green rev revolution, you have the uh, Tesla revolution, demand for copper and nickel and, and all these metals will be well much larger than we could, can produce. I'm curious process-wise, how do you go about finding these companies that are focused on the discovery side, are you, what does the due diligence look like when you're, when you're putting yeah, that, that, portfolio together? That's the hardest part, but we have a team of researchers worldwide. We have at least four or five researchers working on this full time every day. We have one guy in Hong Kong who um, watched the Australian markets for us. So we have one guy in, in North America. We have a few people in our office in Europe. We get an awful amount of uh, broker research we even pay Canaccord to get their research directly. So uh, we have all the newsletters from geologists. And we built this system for the last, uh, well, almost 15 years. And now we build it in a way that 
each and every discovery being made by a listed company, and there are 1,500 listed exploration companies worldwide, we have on our radar within 24 hours. That's a good place to end this space, Willem. I certainly appreciate you spending the time with us. Hopefully we'll do another one of these with some other thought leaders. Everybody, please make sure you follow Willem Middlecoop. And again, his book is available on Amazon, multiple books, actually. Willem, any any kind of final thoughts here before we uh, close off the space for the audience? Yeah, you don't have to buy my book on Amazon. You can do it if you want a hard copy, but you can download it for free on at our website. So if you go to the Commodity Discovery Fund website, just Google download the big reset commodity fund. You'll find the link and you can download the full manuscript right away. Even better. <laughs> Thank you for yeah. joining. Thank you, Willem. <laughs> and uh, everybody enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Willem.